there are a limited range of different interconnects that can be used uh, between different audio equipment. When it comes to the stuff that's basically unamplified uh, audio signal between your controller and, um, and a speaker that has an amplifier built in, between the sound system that you'll be using on uh, Monday and whatever gear that we plugged in, you largely get these kinds of cables. And there's kind of two big categories. There's the coaxial cable, where it's just a piece of copper in the middle, and then you've either got foil, or on a higher end, you have kind of like a braided uh, copper uh, uh, shield around the cable. And of course, it's all protected by insulation. These tend to be a little bit thinner and more flexible. Um, you might see that, for instance, in your um, regular sort of headphone type cables or where you might plug your phone into a sound system. Um, and uh, over here, we've got a pair of RCA cables, which should look a lot like the kinds of cables that you're using to connect your controllers up with, um, with any gear. So basically, there's only two conductors. There's this thing in the middle, and then there's this cylinder that surrounds it. Uh, whether that's braided or whether that's basically a, a cylindrical sheet. And RCA connectors are known as single-ended connectors. Just because the cable is coaxial doesn't mean that the connector needs to be coaxial, but in this particular case, you know, both the, the cable in, in inside and the, um, and the connector uh, kind of resemble each other. There's the thing in the middle and then there's the thing that surrounds it. The thing that surrounds it is generally connected to whatever the ground bus of your gear is going to be. And the whole point is to just absorb electrical interference. If there's um, fluorescent lighting around, if you know, somebody puts their phone near a cable or something like that, the whole idea of this is that that's connected to ground, send it to ground pretty much in the same way that a lightning rod is designed to sort of like send any electrical voltage or any current away from the things that you actually want to protect. And in this case, it's your audio signal that you're trying to protect. It also establishes a base reference level, uh, which is measuring the signal that's actually coming through this one single conductor in the middle. So if this is going positive or this is going negative, then it's comparing it against this shield to figure out should the speaker be going out, should the speaker be going in, you know, is the signal going up or is the signal going down. Some people refer to this as hot and this is cold. So like there's actually no signal that's deliberately being put in here. There might be noise, there might be like the return current uh, depending on how your, your, your electrical circuit is wired. But really the signal that we're worried about is inside this conductor and there's ways to be able to wire things up where only that red line is actually connecting two circuits together and then the other two are sort of connected ground some, in some other esoteric way. This is a tip and sleeve connector. Some people call these jack connectors or quarter inch connectors because they're quarter inch in diameter. These are also single ended. That's why there's this cable over here that's RCA on one end and is quarter inch on the other end. The tip is the hot, the sleeve is the shield. But if you've got a cable that actually has three connectors, like this, then this is actually used for more than one thing. And without sort of knowing a little bit more about what's inside the cable or taking a look at what's on the other end of the cable, sometimes it's unclear what this connector is actually carrying. We've got a cable over here that actually has three conductors. You might think it has four because that thing around the outside looks like a metal conductor, but it's not. It's not actually connected to anything. It's, just, it's, it's metal for durability. Um, it's not really electrically connected to anything, or at least it shouldn't be. There might be a short circuit in there, but this one's pretty good. Uh, but we have three connectors, and then we have three conductors, one, two, three. The tip is still, con is still carrying a signal, but in the middle, we have this thing called the ring, and that is actually carrying the same signal as the tip, only inverted. So where the tip is sending a signal that's going to positive voltage, the ring is going to be sending exactly the same, same signal, negative voltage. You've got two signals that are basically doing exactly the opposite thing from each other. And these are designed to be carrying signal over what's basically a pair of twisted 
cables inside a shield. The theory is that if you've got any kind of electrical interference, uh, the shield's going to be like the first line of defense. And again, that's connected to the ground of whatever equipment that you're connecting together. If any interference gets through, the theory is that that interference is going to affect both of these cables about the same. So there is noise in the cables, but both of them have the same noise. They're carrying opposite signals, so when you plug it into a device like these speakers that actually has a connector like this, tip ring sleeve in this sort of fashion where the red is the hot and the blue is the opposite of the hot, so it's no longer cold, it's actually plus and minus. They're carrying the same, they're both carrying signal, but one of them is carrying a positive signal, one of them is car carrying the inverse of that same s signal. When it's being connected to gear like that, they will invert the signal again and add them up to each other. So if previously the signals did this, they will flip one of those signals and then they'll add it back together. And as a result, any noise that's being carried on these two will also get inverted again and add it to each other. And as a result, cancel each other out. This is super old tech. This is Alexander Graham Bell tech. The basic idea of, well, one way we can get rid of noise over a long run of cable is to just twist them together and then send the opposite signal on each of these wires so that when we, add, when we flip one around and then we add it up again, we take the same noise and we delete it from itself. Right? And we're also making the signal stronger as a result. We're sort of in, in, in improving that signal to noise ratio. This is also known as a balanced cable or a balanced signal going through a cable. You know, the cable is just copper. Sometimes you get silver. The nice thing about balance is that not only can you carry signals a very, very long distance without really picking up a lot of noise along the way, uh, you can also carry some very low voltage signals pretty far without um, hearing a whole lot of additional noise. That's why almost all microphones, at least in the sort of the pro audio space, a microphone will basically have one of these ends. This is known as XLR. It's referred to as male and female. If, if anyone has better terminology, I will be glad to switch to that. If you look really closely and if you have better eyes than I do, you might actually be able to see each one of those pins has a number. One, two, and three. Um, they're kind of arranged on like the bottom half or you know one half of a, a of a full circle. Number one is always the shield. Number two typically is the positive signal. Number three is a negative signal. But because of the way how this topology works, if you switch number two and three, it will still work. The end result will be the inverse of the signal than you had sent it originally. But as long as you're consistent. That's not a problem, you're still getting good audio through the system. So instead of your speaker going out, it goes in. Not a huge problem unless you've got like a mix of miswired cables all living in the same space. That is the most reliable cable that you typically work with. Um, another nice thing about these cables is that you can sort of daisy chain them. Um, you know, you can attach them to each other to just make additional lengths. So I've got a pile of mostly 25 feet cables here. But if I need a 50 foot cable, I just daisy chain them and they have a locking mechanism that keeps them in place. And most equipment where you plug them into also has a locking equipment. Not all things that you plug an uh, uh, XLR connector to has a locking catch, but usually you will pay a little bit more and there's a locking catch, which prevents it from getting yanked out. However, if you see a TRS connector like this, this is very similar. This is also a TRS connector, but it's very, very close to what you've got on for your headphones, right? It's actually the same size, it's 3.5 millimeters. Um, and it is also TRS, it's just not a quarter inch TRS, it's 3.5 millimeter TRS. And you've got one connector here and it comes out to two ends. Then you know that this is being used for, to carry a stereo unbalanced signal and not a balanced signal. It's actually carrying two of these signals. The tip is going to be the left. and the ring is going to be the right. There's no negative signal to compare it against. If you misread this and you thought that a stereo signal was actually carrying a balanced signal, you'd actually be taking 
the left channel and cancelling it out with the right channel, which is going to give you the left minus the right channel, which can sound very, very, very strange. It can kind of sound like the music is behind you almost. The shield is actually just shorted with the minus pin. So instead of like comparing it against the negative signal, you're just comparing it to ground. You lose all of the benefits of having this kind of cable inside your wires, although usually you'll find this kind of cable, which is a little bit cheaper. But you lose all of the noise rejection benefits of this, but it'll still work. It'll still work over the same length of cable that would normally work for a typical single-ended cable. Speakers like these, they have their own amplifier in them. And so you use the same cables that you use for any other audio gear. But for speakers where there's no amplifier, it really is just a box with a couple of cones and coils. Maybe they have a crossover unit. They're expecting to get plus minus 40 volts from an amplifier somewhere. Um, and if you think about it sort of intuitively, the voltages are higher for speakers. So you kind of need higher specs for the cables that are actually driving the speakers, especially if you're running them over a long distance. So they have those thick, thick cables that are designed to carry very high current. Those are only used in situations where your amplifier is separate from your speaker. So that's why they need to carry those high voltages. The thing that's bringing up your signal level from something like 5 volts to 40 volts is in a rack somewhere. It's probably near where the DJ is or near where the band is. And then we're running at a fairly long distance away to speakers on the left and the right or on the stage. Speak-on connectors are basically a weatherproofed version of bare cables, right? They've actually got four connectors in there. You can use it for two different channels. It's very movie-like, right? Because you insert it and you turn it one quarter to lock it. It's just a much more rugged way to connect the speaker cable instead of like bare wire going into an unprotected slot. This thing prevents water and dust from getting in. And it's deliberately incompatible with these to prevent you from sending speaker level voltages into your, into your non-speakers, right? Because that will fry your gear. Your regular gear is expecting something under 5 volts, um, maybe a, around 5 volts at most. And the speakers are expecting something on like 40 volts. While the outsides of the cable tend to be pretty tough, the insides actually tend to be pretty delicate, um, which is a good reason why you shouldn't be throwing cables around. Uh, it's pretty easy to break a cable, and it's usually not the middle of the cable that breaks, unless you stretch it and you stress it. But there's usually uh, the connectors that break by just throwing things around, especially on concrete. Twisted pair cables tend to be a little bit thicker than single-ended cables. There's just more wires in there. Um, sometimes they even have a little bit of fabric in there just to give the cable a little bit more resilience. You're not just relying on the, on the rubber insulator or the plastic insulator to, to give the cable strength, right? It, need, it needs to resist stretching. Um, for the sort of the thinner coaxial cables, they're usually sold to you like this, you know, so, so, sort of bent like this. Um, it's not the best thing for the cable, but also not, not the worst thing for the cable. Because it's a thinner cable, it's kind of already more flexible. But these, these are not designed to be super flexible cables, um, and they're sold to you in a coil. And you kind of always want to put it back in a coil, and you certainly don't want to be stretching it, and you don't want to be doing, you know, what you might do to rope. Like, you don't want to stretch it over your elbow. And then you're just stressing the copper inside and eventually it's going to break and it's going to fail. These cables are more expensive than these cables, so you want these to last longer. You know, the connectors are more expensive, the, the, the actual cable is more expensive and you want to take care of them. So every time you're done with them, you want to sort of put them back in a coil. But there is a right way and there's a wrong way to make a coil. And you'll know that when, when you're doing it wrong, when the, the nice circles that you're trying to make turned out to be a figure eight. So instead of getting circles, you're getting figure eight loops. And what it is is basically there is an inherent tension inside this cable that is not being released while you make it into a loop. And, um, and that tension is bending it into a figure eight. Does anyone here do like um, rock climbing or sailing? And that's exactly the same problem that we get with rope. If you are relying on rope for your, for, for your life because you're rock climbing or you're mountain climbing or you are sailing, uh, then you, know, you also want to take care of your ropes. 
the intermediate way to coil a, a, a cable, every time you bring it over, I, typically I have one end of the cable pointing away from me, so the cable comes towards me. And you bring it to you, and then you just keep doing that. But every time you bring it in, you take a look at the coil, and you make sure that you're releasing any tension in it. I'm going to do a couple of loops where I don't release the tension. There we go. So, so that's bad, right? You get these figure eights because I'm, I'm not properly releasing the tension. So what I got to do is I got to let go of all the cable that's kind of doing all of that. As I bring it up, I'm actually rotating my hand inwards a bit to sort of make sure that the tension in the cable is actually following the loop. And already you can still see there's a little bit of tension. It's not a perfect circle right there. Now this is super hard to do if your cable is so long that you can't actually lift it up in the air because there's nowhere for all the tension in the cable to get released. Well, there is the slightly more advanced way, which most of you who actually do rock climbing may be already familiar with, which is you take this cable, the first loop is exactly the same as before. In the second loop, I bring it inside. So I, can people see you there? The loop is not going on the outside. The loop is going on the inside. And then you alternate that. So the next loop on the outside, the next loop goes on the inside. Let me do that one more time, but a little bit tighter, because I think this cable wants to be a little bit tighter. Here we go. And the nice thing about this is that in order to, to, uh, to execute this, you don't have to release the tension in the rest of the cable. You are actually just, just releasing the tension by going inside, outside, inside, outside. None of these methods prevent your cables from getting knotted up. Uh, cables get knotted up because sometimes, you know, I've got a coil over here and sometimes it flips on the inside and now we've got a knot. Um, and it will happen with any of these methods. So the point of coiling in this way is not to prevent knots. The point of coiling it this way is to prevent tension. You take care of your cables, they'll last a long time. Um, the thickest cables that you'll probably run into are power cables, just extension cords. You know, long extension cords, they're gonna be, they're designed to carry a lot of current, so they're very thick. They need this sort of treatment even more. Um, you can tell when someone's misused an uh, extension cord because there's just like a lot of kinks in them and they'll never get back into a loop again. I will not necessarily want to trust my expensive gear to it. <laughs>